terrible lighting. Sorry about the terrible lighting in here and the, my phone is smashed up so I gotta, I'm taking it in today to get fixed but you can hear me anyway. I hope. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna show you something. This is uh, Acts 15 which is super important. This is where they discuss in uh, the Council of Jerusalem how the Gentiles should be saved and they give them a, a few uh, few things to notice in the Rainbow Covenant and in the um, Ten Commandments and then they tell the people to go and learn what Moses said about the Messiah uh, taught every Sabbath day. This is the um, this is what they first tell them to do but just before that they're talking with each other trying to uh, come to a conclusion here about what they're supposed to do right and I want to show you something that's interesting. And the I'm starting at verse 6. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider this matter. So what they were doing was telling people that they had to be um, circumcised. Okay? So the whole story is the refreshing of the covenant. He uh, magnified the law. He elevated the law to what God really wanted it to be from the beginning. And so this is, this is if you don't know the Old Testament, the reason why uh, Yeshua always spoke in parables and he spoke in such a way that... You know, he spoke plainly sometimes, and he said, obey my commandments. And other times, he spoke in part of me in parables because people aren't going to listen to him. And the ones that are deemed to hear him are going to go and actually go search out what he says because they care about what the Messiah says. They actually care about salvation and and uh, to be in the kingdom and their families, and, and they want to do what God wants. And that's the difference between people. That's what faith is. Faith is actually obedience. So, so the apostles and the elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Okay. By Peter's mouth. So, it's a good idea to go and read First and Second Peter and pay attention to what Peter is saying. You know how a lot of people will say, oh, we just have to listen to Paul, okay? What did Peter say about Paul? That the Gentiles are going to twist the words of Paul to their own destruction. And, and because they twist the, the other words of the scriptures, See, when Paul was always quoting the scriptures, so when people don't read what Paul is quoting, they'll never know. It's the same thing with Yeshua. When they don't know what his, um, what his um, parables are about, they're going to have problems. Hey, John, how's it going? Okay, so this is interesting. So there's much disputing. Peter rises up and says that he's, he was supposed to convert these Gentiles. So first and second Peter is important. And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So this is talking about grace. So he gives them grace and that purifies their hearts by faith. That's the conviction on their hearts. They've completely perverted the words of God, you guys. They are telling you that it's unmerited favor, and this is not what grace is. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God to put the yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? That's sacrificial law. It was added because of transgression to the holy covenants. So the point is, if God is, is, if God's spirit is with you, convicting your heart to follow his holy covenants ordained of old, then you are no longer under sacrificial law. And you're being cleansed from your unrighteousness. As long as you remain in him, he will remain in you. So, this is the point. Nobody's going to be perfect out of the gate. They're going to be constantly walking or running the race and... And this is the point. They, that's why they gave them a starting point to even go and just, here's a few things, go and start doing this. 
like this, it's right here, but that we write unto them, I'm jumping ahead to chapter or verse 20 and 21, but write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols. Okay. That's idolatry. Now, idolatry is rampant through the church right now. And from fornication, which is unholy um, sexual conduct. Okay. So there's certain things that are sanctified, certain things that are not, right? And we see what happens when people are full of pride, then anything goes. And that's where we're at right now. And that's why the sin that leads to death is the, is the idols. And it ends with pride. And then the fornication is everywhere. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed as a testimony of what's coming down the pipe right now. So we're at that place. He recompenses the sins under the third and fourth generation of those who do Christmas trees and Easter bunnies. This is basic. I'm just putting it in today's terms. From And from things strangled and from blood. Okay, that's rainbow covenant. Okay, and it's elevated. He elevated it to, to whoever is grafted into Israel. You can see, I can't remember which chapters they're in. Uh, they're in Leviticus and they're also in Deuteronomy. I, I just can't remember which chapters, but you can go and read it. Um, in Noah's day, he only sacrificed things that were clean, but all men were told never to eat blood. All men, didn't matter. Shem, Ham, Japheth. And Israel was different. They were to eat the clean animals and make difference between holy and profane. So now that we're all grafted into the commonwealth of Israel through these rainbow covenants, then we have to... We have to look at the, the details of the law and understand the law. And, and you are not, not to do sacrificial law. Don't touch the mountain. Don't look at now. Therefore, why tempt God to put the yoke in the neck on the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. That was a sacrificial law. They were given a time until the times of refreshing, till the promise came. They had to abide by this um, sacrificial law. It was a punishment. Okay. But we believe that through the grace, back to grace again, which is conviction of our Lord Yeshua, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Okay, wait a minute here. There's something that I wanted to see here or, or go to, and I'm, I must have missed it. I'll find it, though. Hold on. <clears throat> I'll just keep reading because it's going to be coming. But we, okay. Then I'll, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Where was I? Then after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take of them a people for his name. <coughs> and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. This is where you stop and say, what prophet has written this? Okay, He's about to say what, what was written. After this, so after this, I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build it again, the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. So what's he going to do? He's going to take a portion of Gentiles, Gentiles unto his name, and then he will, and then will return. <coughs> After this, I will return. So he tarries for the two days. And I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord who does all these things. So this is the crazy part. After he tarries for two days, this is when the tribulation comes. The second exodus happens. The whole entire church does not know about the second exodus. And the Gentiles who are called by his name at the end days will live amongst the tabernacle of David when it's, when it's built. 
This is the kingdom being restored. We're living in the times of refreshing until the rest, restoration of all things. So, how can, how can the church have the audacity to bypass the truth in this Bible when it's right here in your New Testament? And the residue of men, the residue of men, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build it again. The ruins thereof I will set up. So the tabernacle of David is fallen down. Well, why? Because the church is apostate. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not, which are from among the Gentiles that are turned unto God. I'll repeat myself again. I'll read these two verses because they're super important. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols. That's in the Ten Commandments. And from fornication and from the things strangled and from blood. Now, fornication, you know, is, is to, don't commit adultery. So pure, the pure, un, unadulterated, um, matrimony is that's pure. Everything else is fornication. Even looking at a woman or a man with lust in your eyes is fornication. And then you say, well, how in the world are we not going to be able to do that? You know, every time you turn on the television, someone's, you know, junk is hanging out, you know? Well, when you truly want to follow the Holy Covenants, God will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yeshua said that he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Okay? So believe. This is your faith. This is your faith. But what was he talking about here with the tabernacle of David? So we're going to Amos chapter 9. Amos is all about the destruction of a wicked, wicked nation that's leading the way in, in all of this. This is where the remnant of Joseph is spoken of. What did it say? The remnant? Okay. This is where the second exodus begins. In other places, it's called the remnant of Ephraim. And this is Ephraim, my firstborn. So the firstborn, you can conclude that once this city, this powerful nation, it's called, that's more powerful than their brother Manasseh. So they're going to be related to Manasseh, but they are going to be the younger son, meaning the last born will get the firstborn blessing. Okay. And I, and I believe that's a double portion. So there's a chunk of people coming out of the most powerful nation. That's a multitude of nations within a nation that God has scattered to the furthest place away from, from Jerusalem. And that's where your second exodus begins to the isles afar off. Okay. Chapter nine, Amos, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar and he said, smite the lintel of the door and the posts may, sh that the, mo oh, that the posts may shake and cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away. And he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, thence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea... Thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. Now, do you see what thing people are doing right now? There are so many underground cities and bunkers and all that stuff going on. It's um, it's, it's quite uh, quite interesting that people are aware something's coming. Coming these elite in your in your countries, although they go into captivity before their enemies. Thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. Well, like, see, this is what he's quoting in Acts 15. Doesn't sound very pretty, does it? And the Lord of hosts is he that touches the land, and it shall melt. And all that dwell therein shall mourn. And it, and, um, and it shall rise up holy like a flood, and shall be drowned. As by fire, the flood of Egypt. 
or sorry, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. Sorry. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and he that foundeth his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. This is, that's the sixth seal it's talking about right there. Are you not the children, are ye not as the children of Ethiopia, of the, blah, 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 of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Saith the Lord, have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kephor, Kephtor and the Syrians from Kerr? Behold my eye, behold the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom. I wonder what, what's the most sinful kingdom right now? Who's promoting the most sin right now? And I will destroy it from the face, destroy it off the face of the earth, saving that I will not, not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. You're going to want to be understanding the house of Jacob. House of Jacob is a very different um, idiom. It's an idiom. It is not about your bloodline per se. It is about your heart. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations like corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. Which say, this is what they're going to say, the evil shall not overtake or prevent us. I noticed this actually in one of my sister's tweets. It's, um, it's kind of a repeat of another place in the same book. I'm going to just read that quickly. So they're going to say, all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, this is, so they're the ones that say this, the evil shall not overtake us or prevent us. So what? What's the context of that? I'll tell you. In their hearts, they have entitlement. I talk about it all the time. It's pride. Pride comes before destruction. They think nothing's going to happen to them. And they're not loving their neighbors as themselves. They are sinners because they reject to the, keep the Ten Commandments. That's why the, the tabernacle of David is, is going to be rebuilt. Okay, But I'm going to read it for you in a different place here. And all the vineyards shall be wailing, and I will pass through thee, says the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. What end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him and went, or went into a house and leaned his hand upon the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away the no uh, from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of the vials. But let judgment run, run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have, have you offered me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and your Chion and your image, your image and the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. Therefore, I will cast you, I will cause you to go down into captivity. It was telling you about captivity. Beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Well, when in Acts 7, verse 43, when, when um, um, Stephen is prophesying this about, it's, he, says, he doesn't use the word Damascus. Guess what he uses? Babylon. So this sinful city is Babylon. See, it's just, the Bible is amazing when you make these connections. It just, and, and it's so intricately written that when we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, we we boast the Holy Spirit, not our own selves. But you know what that's all about? You know why I do that for your guys' sake? So you know the Holy Spirit is speaking the truth through my mouth. 
There's no way a dummy like me could ever figure this Bible out unless he chose to use my mouth to tell you guys. And that means he loves you just the same as he loves me. Because he's not going to reveal these things only to his servants. I will do nothing. It's even in the same book. In chapter 2 or 3, I do nothing unless I reveal it first to my servants, the prophets. And that means that it's already written in the prophets and we are able to see it. Enter into the work of the prophets, reap what, I, what he sows, and together you will rejoice. So he makes us slaves for his people's sake, and that is the par portion of Jacob. Jacob, my servant, okay? But he's not going to utterly cut everybody off. Those who have ears to hear are not going to go through this. Well, they're going to go through punishment somewhat, and nobody's going to like it, you know? I don't care how tough a dude you are. When God's hand is over, over us, we're all going to be trembling. And we're going to be, when we go through the second exodus, we're going to be crying because of the, everybody will be weeping and mourning because unfortunately all 19 of you that are in here and myself, it's all our fault. <coughs> we all sinned and transgressed against the Lord, but because of his name's sake, it's, don't think it's of yourselves or your righteousness. He poured out his spirit to convert you. And that's what Acts 15 is telling you. So, for lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet none sh not the least grain shall fall upon the earth. And all, but all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake us nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and choose and, and close up the breaches thereof. And, and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it, it as in the days of old that, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all, and all of the heathen which are called by my name, says the Lord that does this. The heathen are the Gentiles. Okay? Behold the days. So the, the, the Gentiles are going to come to repentance. But how does that happen? Remember where Yeshua says, great is the fall of that house. They didn't build, the flood overtakes them. What's the flood? The sixth seal. They didn't build on the rock. The rock's the Ten Commandments. Yeshua is the Ten Commandments. He came and taught us the Ten Commandments. And, and we're, we're such a wicked people, we can't listen to our own, our own king for our own lives' sake and our own children's sake. That's how wicked we are. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and all... Part of me, all the heathen which are called by my name, says the Lord that does this. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the, the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel. So they're captive. Why are they captive? Because they're scattered into the Gentiles, and the church did not look for the elect chosen people of God. This whole time. Well, your Bible tells you that. He's angry at the, the gospel. Okay, so the Gentiles were given salvation and, and the Jews were told to go and find the lost sheep of the house of Israel too. Then also, these Gentiles that converted were also supposed to do that and proclaim, proclaim the, the good news that the captives are set free and they can return. Nobody did that. Nobody did that. So the lost sheep just kept getting mingled deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the Gentiles, right? And then, so by election in the last days, he's raising up his servant Jacob and Israel his elect. So the, the spirit of them is going to be of the old days. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the, I said that already, and I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their, their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, says the Lord thy God. To me, absolutely amazing. And you could do your own study to understand. I will talk about it, but you should study this out. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about the, the camera quality. I'm taking my phone to get fixed today. Um, 
my phone takes a beating. I'm on it all the time. And um, so this, this group of people called Ephraim is the blessing to Joseph back in Jeremiah, or sorry, 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 Genesis chapter 37, I think it goes to 51, right? Read the story a couple times about, about this, because even in the book of, I think it's chapter six of Amos, what we were just reading here, it's saying these people are going to forget the affliction of Joseph, okay? Now, the affliction of Joseph. Uh, when I was reading that years ago, that was one of the first things that, that God revealed to me. Praise God for this. This is how come I know this stuff. This is the beginning way back. I look back, I could almost cry how much he's shown me. But there's a reason for him showing me these things. And, it's, and you guys are the reason. And so one of the things way back, I don't know, five or six years ago, I can't even remember anymore. One day just blends into another now or always has really. And, um, and so he, he showed me this and, um, the affliction of Joseph, I was reading it and I'm like, I was just reading that, that book to by myself back in those days. And I'm like, no, Lord, I'm not going to forget that. I want, I'm not going to do be that guy, you know? And so I went and I studied chapter 37 to 51. <clears throat> I read it a couple times because at first I didn't get it. And then, and, and I wanted to get it. And then he led me on a journey. Once I, once I committed my heart, because he, that's, him, that's how he speaks to you. So he pricks your heart with the spirit of grace, which convicts you to say to him, it says the spirit of grace will even, even show, uh, put the words in your mouth to talk to him. So as long as you're living in faith, this is what's going to happen to you. And that's how you're going to know the Bible. It's not of yourself. It's from him. And so it, he pricked my heart. I didn't know what the affliction of Joseph was. So I went and started studying all this stuff. And, and then so it led me to Hosea. And I started looking up everything about Ephraim. Now, Manasseh was born first. But Joseph crosses his hands and gives the blessing to Ephraim, which should have went to Manasseh, right? According to firstborn blessings, right? And Joseph was perturbed at this. But Jacob said, no, my son, this is the way it has to be. So Manasseh is this great nation that rises up and is preceded by Ephraim, this other great nation that's going to even be more powerful. And it is the end days generation, the most powerful nation. And its quality is that it has a multitude of different types of people, which is all talking about the prophecies about God scattering all of his people into all nations and tongues and languages and all this stuff throughout history and then gathering them to one place and fulfilling what he's, he's going to do. His hand was in um, putting America where it is, obviously. I mean, he built the continent with his own hands, you know. How is he going to destroy it? Well, you guys got a big fat volcano there, I'll tell you that. And it's close to me too. It's all of us are in danger of this. So what's going to happen? Okay, so he deems us in this continent, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, that's a name. He deems us Sodom and Egypt, Mystery Babylon, Tyre and, and Sidon, Nineveh. All these names are naming this wicked nation that we live in, the fading flower, the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay, it's over and over and over again through the Bible. And when you discover it and see it, you know, there, there's no unseeing it. So when you love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to go and warn the people because, because of this reason. Because God said, my people are in there, Mark, go get them. God told me to warn America. So I'm going to go and find these people because <clears throat> I know that there's a beautiful group of people in there and I'm adamant to do what I was told to do. And I'm telling you, on the flip side, there is a boatload of you guys in, the, in America that are more wicked in the church than I could even ever imagine. I've never seen such wickedness. Even in these people who raise up and start keeping the Torah and then go back and they don't even care about their own people. 
And, it, and it, you know what? It does. It angers me. I'm up here in Canada shouting down like Jonah to Nineveh. And so few people even know that I'm even doing this. And your Bible even tells you he's going to do this in the last days. But I know most people don't read their Bible, so how are they supposed to know that? Because they're, they're fitting the bill right there. They, they think nothing's going to happen to them. They think nothing's going to happen to them. And their destruction will come in one day. You know, you know what true, truly loving your brothers and sisters is? Is warning them. Putting yourself out there warning them, knowing what scripture says so you can help them. That's what loving your neighbor is yourself is. Come out of her, my people, so you don't suffer the consequences of her sins. That's what Yeshua said. He's talking to Mystery Babylon. Well, loving your neighbor as yourself is re rebuking the sin out of the people, which nobody has been doing for hundreds of years. And so in the last days, he's going to raise up his servant Jacob to do it. And the remnant is going to be saved. You, and nobody can do anything about that. The remnant's going to be saved, no matter if you think so or not. That's what's going to happen. I, I, I mean, that's the way you got to look at the Bible. You know, some of you, and don't be hard on yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. I talk like this in every single one of my videos. If you want, if you want um, to fast track the Bible, then you should know that I've read this thing well over 50,000 hours because it's well over that because I've been I've been doing this for such a long period of time trying to reach out to warn the people and there are some some people take my videos and then they share them and I'm telling you there's a lot of people preaching lies and your Bible told you a lot of people are going to be preaching lies it's very simple to return to the Lord there's a lot of things that are not sanctified for us to do until he he returns his people like the feasts and so on and so forth. He, this is how much he loves you guys. He didn't make it hard for you to return. Just keep his covenants, okay? Keep his covenants because, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you right now, this is how foolish some of these guys that are pushing extra things on you that are not required. <sighs> They're casting stumbling blocks in front of the people. And people need to know that. Because God only wants his people to keep the covenants. They're in captivity right now. The fullness of the Gentiles comes in. The remnants, uh, Israel's going to rise up. Many are called, but few are chosen. The devil sows the tares with the wheat. The tares do not care about their own people at all. What they're really thinking in their heart is they figured out the calendar or they've figured out the feasts and they're saved. They're not really warning other people. They're, some of them would be, I know that. And, and it's according to their own strength too. Okay, like there's a lot of details about this. If so, as long as a person, because I am not picking on anybody, but I'm telling you, there's a general problem out there which is prophesied to happen that many are called and few are chosen, and people are going to flat earth or they're going to they're not going into the Bible like they should be and coming to the conclusion of who they are and what they're supposed to be doing in these last days. They should be warning the people, putting aside all of their worldly thoughts and lusts, whatever you want to call it, they're, 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 I'm not telling you to quit your job unless the Holy Spirit tells you to, but you could do work. He, he wants you to work. He's saying this, if I've opened up your ears, boys and girls, and you're not willing to help out, then I might not save you. And that's the truth. Because the tree that doesn't bear fruit gets hewn down. The bearing fruit, I'm going to somehow try to figure out how to explain this to you. The tree that bears fruit knows what the Bible says that they're supposed to do. That's what the fruit is. And the fruit is, and some will produce 100, 60, or 30 fold. What is that talking about? It's raising people up. It's saving... That's why he will make you rulers of, of many cities if you do his will. The fulfilling the royal law, you will do well according to scripture. James is telling you this. Look, it's just crazy. Look, put, look at the perspective of this. James, okay, look at who he's talking to. Pay attention. It's not very hard to, to discover this. 
I certainly can't do it by myself. There's a, a watchtower that needs to be built. It's got to be a watchtower is full of stones and those stones have to work together as a team. They are going to be led by certain people that know more and they're not doing it to be rulers over you. They're doing it to save your life. James, a servant of our Lord and of the Lord, uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Yeshua Messiah to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greetings. Well, when does the tabernacle of David get rebuilt? <laughs> There's your clue right there. Not until the last days. That's why in Judah right now, and they're against the two houses, they are, are going into the pit in a certain country. Okay? Because they are rejecting except for a remnant. There's going to be a good remnant of Judah, so don't be picking on everybody, but warn them so they also have the chance to repent from this because it's sheer wickedness. Because Judah thinks loving your neighbor as yourself is the same thing as the Christian church. Going and giving money. Putting a band-aid on things. Watch this. But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? What it, The judgment even is to judge the fatherless and the widow. You know? What's the cause? That's sin. So make sure people know that cause. That's why people are... That's what it means. It's an idiom. And it's, do not they blaspheme the worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. That's the royal law. To fulfill it, you will do well. But if you respect, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as a transgressor. So when you see your Christian people sinning and you do nothing about it, now you are convinced as a sinner under the law because you wouldn't do anything about it so i suggest you do something about it now do you see why i make videos every day almost you know and i don't do it because i'm i'm afraid of the punishment i do it because i genuinely care about you people but i would never genuinely care about you people unless god put it in my heart to do so so right there i'm going to get punched in the face by people who God put his spirit in me to love them and tell them the truth and they're going to blaspheme me, which is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit as well. Crazy, isn't it? They're going to go up against his servants and they will be punished for this thing. They will gather together against, but not by me. And anybody who raises up against his servants, including you guys, if you take on the responsibility do a little here, a little there. Try your hardest, you know. You can do something. You can make a letter and put it on people's windshields at the churches and tell them to repent. You know, show them some scriptures that you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, the sky's the limit. Be creative. You can go on Twitter. You can go on Reddit. You can go tell the truth. Not holding back. Don't tolerate Jezebel. Tell them the because I'm telling you this, the people who are ordained to wake up are already ordained to wake up. They will hear the sharp rebuke against the fables. The ones that want to hear the smooth ear tickling words are the ones that we just read about. They're going to they're gonna think that they're safe. It's in their heart already. The strong delusion, okay? But the ones that are deemed to hear will hear. And the evil servants that are called, many called and few are chosen, the lazy, the slothful, the unprofitable, um, the slanderous, the smiters, they smite the ones that are doing the work because they can't tell the truth. They're all in, in Yeshua's parables, you guys, and it's all about the end days. All of it, all of it, all of it is about the end days. And all you have to do is start learning where is he talking about these things in the Old Testament prophets. And when you see, it's all about the end days. So all of his, all of his parables about the servants are all about us. And so look at it this way. When poop does hit the fan and you find yourself holding the ball, you're going to look backwards and say, man, I wish I did what I was told. Because... Now, nothing, none of your possessions are going to be worth anything. Nothing at all is going to be of any value. And it will, you're going to cast, your silver and gold will not save you. 
you will be sitting there holding the ball like an idiot because you did not try to wake up your people. If a Canadian can love his neighbor, his American neighbor, as himself and give up his life for eight years, then why can't you at least pick up the phone and call your family or your friends and warn them? Why can't you go onto Twitter and join the fight? Why can't you go to a church and have a talk with the pastor or some of the people that, you're, that are in your church and warn them what, what I just said? Why can't you do that? There's one lady I know, she prints out letters. She, 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 has, she uh, buys a bunch of Bibles and she hands them out. She has no shame. She's not proud. She's not worried what they say to her. She just does it. Another lady, she prints off things, and, um, whatever they're called, like just paper, and then she puts them in people's windshields when they go to church. They come out of the church, and I think she's even been asked to leave private property, stuff like that, but she does, she does her work. I haven't talked to her in a while, but she does it. She does what little she can and with little strength. You know, she doesn't, she, she doesn't even understand a lot, but she, she knows to keep the holy covenants, and she's trying. You know, that's what these people do. Other people have raised up and they start getting to work and then they peter off and they don't do anything. Other people raise up, then they start to speak evil against others that are telling the truth because I don't know why. I know what the Bible says, but I don't know what causes a person to change in their heart except for envy. It's always envy and they turn back. It's exactly this. If, if I were to say it's really wise for you to just give up your life and start getting to work because in a very short time, it's all your work means nothing anyways because everybody's going to be going through what's, what's about to come. So your time is best spent doing the will of God. But what happens with these guys that started, we'll say, doing that they stopped and they were more interested in their building their business or getting things to entertain them in their life rather than doing the work of God. And I've witnessed it. And it, I'm talking that men that knew the Bible too. They knew these things. They, they were involved in learning massive amounts of scripture. But what do they do? They don't use it. They don't use their knowledge and wisdom to even lift a finger. One of these guys is hindsight 2020 type situation. You're, you're patient, plus I didn't even know as much at the beginning either. So God was always giving me the meat and due season. But I watched this guy. He was one of the first guys. Well, he was the first guy ever raised up. He sat there going to his church for like three years. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't rebuke them because the reason why, because they would reject him. But when they did finally reject him, that's the only time he stood up against them. But it was for his own selfish reasons. Because they weren't going to accept something he was doing. You know? So, but I used to ask him all the time, did you rebuke and Did you rebuke the pastors? Did you? And he would say, oh, I'm sowing seeds. You know, oh, I say a little bit. You know, they don't really catch on. Because you're not telling them anything. He just would read a scripture. I don't know what he did, but he certainly didn't put an effort into it. And, it, and the reason why I know that, because later on it shows and it, it reflects because the guy fell and it's prophesied to happen. Hey, Alex, how's it going? How you doing, buddy? Hope you guys are doing good. Um, yeah, so the urgency is, is increasing. And God loves his people and he sends forth people, others to, to lead the way into doing the same thing. He puts the porter at the gate and starts shouting repentance. Come into the gate, the porter in the gate, the watchman in the gate, the seer in the gate. It's all the same thing. It's all through prophecy. They're going to hate those who rebuke in the gate. So get used to it. You know, he, he'll make, look at. He makes your face hard against the, this wicked nation. He does that. You know how he does it? 
because he gives you the heart of forgiveness and love for the lost sheep because nobody loved the lost sheep of the house of Israel for all these years. And there's going to be, the Gentiles are going to come with those people and they're going to be saved and they're going to come as a, a, a clean offering to the Lord and everybody's faces will be glad and there'll be rejoicing and the kingdom will be built and everybody will be praising God and will be, he will show us how his feasts work. He's going to restore the calendar. He will turn the sundial back to the way it's supposed to be. And we are going to rejoice with the Lord in his kingdom. Right now, it sucks because we live in the toilet bowl. The toilet bowl happens, then the kingdom right after. So we got to go through the toilet bowl. We got to get out of the toilet bowl and we need to start cleaning house together. You can't do it by yourself. You can't. That's why we have Sabbath gatherings. That's why we, we have support. I mean, your children, there's a group. Um, I think I saw Antonio there. His daughters are starting a, a little group for the children. So if you got kids, you know, that's going to go on. Hopefully it works out really well. You know, like our poor kids, my kid, I, I, I can speak on behalf of her. She's got nobody, you know, nobody. There was a, she did have a little conversation with one of the sister's daughters and they were just talking and giggling about the 10 commandments. So it was kind of fun to, to watch them talking on the phone the other night, you know? So, but that kind of stuff I'd like to see with, with all these people. I mean, why not? Right. On, on the other half, on the other part, um, uh, how, how come if every, and everybody's got to get on the same page, like there's going to be people that are going to join in and you got to all be on the same page. There's the unjust steward is that page. The unjust steward, understanding that parable, whether you understand it a lot or a little, okay, it eventually things start to sink in better and better and better, but we are not to put burdens onto other people. We are to do what God, God is saying this. You guys live in the toilet bowl right now. I made it very easy for my people to return. Do not, don't dare put any stumbling blocks in front of my people. Tell them the simple truth. Tell them that I will give them. I'm already pouring out my grace upon them right now. That is convicting their hearts to obey me. Tell them how simple it is and I will give them the spirit of truth and they, as long as they love me with all their heart, soul, and mind and read my book every day, this is no time to not be reading it. Get into my word, learn what I say and do what I say and you will be saved. And it's not that hard. In fact, the crazy part about me, I could live my life career-minded right now, you know, and I'm not saying this to boast or brag or nothing like that. It's just the point. Okay, this is how God's hands works in people's lives. So I pretty much did give up my career. I took it very, uh, I mean, to the average person <coughs> that lives, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> the average person that lives worldly, which we all did, I did, career-minded, we'll say. Now, I can go out and I can make a decent amount of money quite easily, it's not that hard for me to do. And I haven't given up my job or anything like that. But I take it very casually. Unless I'm at work, I do my work. But if I don't get a phone call, I'm not, I'm not pounding the pavement worrying about if I'm working or not. Because I just trust God opens up whatever door he wants me to go through, it will be opened. I live my life like that and I've been living my life like that since he started talking to me. And I've been doing the work since he's been talking to me. And part of that work was to get cleansed from my own unrighteousness, to come to the Holy Covenants, to learn the difference between sacrificial law and the Holy Covenants of promise. He's the one that did it all to me. So I'm telling you, he'll do the same thing to you as he did to me, as long as you are sitting there saying, yes, Lord, please show me your truth. You just haven't asked for it yet. That's what he requires of us. I didn't know it, but that's what he did to me. He did it because I was such a stiff-necked idiot. I got chastised heavy, big time, big time, big time. And he, he I, I got beat down. Hi, monkey. Hi. How are you? Yeah. So I got beat down like a dog, which I was, until I 
I, I cried out. I had no other choice, right? But he put that in my heart to cry out to him even. Lord, what is the truth? And he spoke to me and said, are you ready to listen? And that's exactly the tone of his voice. Are you ready to listen? And that's what he said to me. And I was in awe. But you know what? When he said that to me and I clearly knew it was him, I heard that voice before many times through my whole life since I was a kid and I never listened to it. But he spoke really loud to me that day and nothing has been the same since. And that's why I know the Bible because I certainly didn't that day and he told me, I will teach you everything that you need to know. I was, not, I was asked if I could go to seminary because I was confused and he said, absolutely not. I will teach you everything that you need to know. And so therefore he did. Whether you believe that or not, that's entirely up to you. But there's a reason why I understand this book, and it certainly isn't because I'm smart. It isn't because I'm smart. I, was a, I had no clue. I mean, I thought I knew the Bible because I went to church for 38 years, but what was I in? I was in the apostate church. So do you swallow your pride and say, man, I was deceived my whole life, and I want the truth, or do you say, I'm not deceived, I'm so smart, I'm so prideful. That's the difference. No, you're all deceived, all of us, every single one, including me. I know, I went to, that's the opera, that's why he used me, because I went to church my whole life. Yeah? What time is it? It is 7.07. So 7.20 and starts the breakfast of our sharing. Okay, do you want to go early? Yeah, Okay. Okay, well, go, go brush your hair. Okay, guys, I should, uh, Gracie wants to go early. I want to go into the city, get my phone fixed, and maybe get a couple things done. Um, otherwise, he's, you know, well, my videos are always just my ugly mug talking anyways, but, I mean, it's all blurry and dark, and it's all cracked up. I can't even, I can't even uh, hit the top right corner. I can't even probably close this video to tell you the truth. That's funny. Because the X is right at the top right-hand corner, so this video might just go into to, uh, to oblivion. I don't know. But anyway, all I want is people to repent and experience what, what, what I have experienced in the Lord speaking. You know, this watchtower has to get built. People are always leaving the watchtower because the prophecies of these rent stones and these black stones and these spotted and all those things. I got to read this book of Hermas. I haven't read it, but I've, I've listened to people read things to me in it. And it's just, it's phenomenal what's going on. What is going on right now is literally the end. And I mean, it's not hard for me to believe it, but I mean, I'll, I'll confess it's still a little surreal to me, all this stuff still. It's a little, it's hard to handle. I mean, it, I'm not going to lie. It's hard to handle. It's hard to know that the world's about to end and so many people are not listening and no, and nobody's hardly warning people out there. There's foolish men out there that they're just like they they claim to be watchmen and they're literally they're they're the tares and they're they're telling people about the end and but they're telling them, "Oh, you're going to get raptured. You're going to get raptured and all this stuff and that's just not what's going to happen." It's not what's going to happen. There's guys out there that learn so much about the Bible because I watched them for years now. For years they've been on YouTube and I've been watching them. And, it, you know, because God puts people in your path, right? And I'm watching these guys and I, and I, I even, you know, I would learn something. They'd learn it like a couple weeks later. And I'm like, wow, that's a confirmation. And they were called to do this work. But then you find out later on that they're not coming to repentance or they're putting stumbling blocks in front of people. They didn't learn I was, you know, we read all the same stuff. I was reading Enoch and all these other removed, yeah, Second Esdras, Baruch, um, the, you know, all these books. There, I mean, there's hundreds of them, you know, and you're you're learning all this stuff off of these books, and it makes complete sense. But then you come to the conclusion, and you're like, but these people in the church that need to repent don't even listen to their Old Testament, and your job is to fulfill the royal law. So what are they doing? These guys are hanging up on the calendar and they don't even know that the, 
the prophets in the, in the Old Testament that we have explain to you that God is going to restore all these other things and that's why the unjust steward so important. But these guys are back hanging on all the calendar thinking they're going to figure it out. And that's not true. They're not going to figure it out. They're, they're trying to... There's so many people on Twitter that are sitting there putting the Hebrew in front of people and people, and all that does is pushes people away. It casts a stumbling block in front of people as if they think that, oh, because they, but they, they can put a Hebrew name and it just causes confusion because all the people, the watchmen are going to wake up, are going to speak English. They can't, they go against, they go against what the job is. The 144,000 get caught to the throne and they return and they judge between the the righteous and the wicked on the earth. They get caught up. This is Zechariah chapter 3 and it's Malachi chapter 3, 16, 17, and 18. They return and they perform what what, even what um, Joel is talking about. They execute judgment. They're the four horsemen. They're under the four horsemen. So there's the horse to the north, east, south, and west. <coughs> four archangels, the man hand, man's hands under the wings of the archangels, they become like archangels. This is the army that has never been in the past and never will ever be again in the future. And they're going to destroy a quarter of the whole entire earth because of sin. And there's other reasons why people are destroyed. So, you know, <coughs> it, that, that you got to go watch my study or my video on the 144,000. But, and, and, and you'll see, like, why, in the, why is nobody in the world teaching correctly the seven seals? Well, who do you think you are, Mark, to think that you're teaching it correctly? Because I show you what it's quoting in the Old Testament. You know, and it's very simple to understand, you know? Like, for instance, it tells you that the, the four angels that were given the power to hurt the earth and the sea, which is the four horsemen, it was told to them to hurt not the earth or the sea until the 144,000 are sealed. So when people don't hear that, which they don't, then they assume the, the four horsemen are like the Antichrist or Elijah or all these different things, and they're not. They're the four archangels around the throne with the 144,000 with them. And it tells you in Zechariah chapter 1 that those four horsemen are roaming the earth right now until it's at rest. Then they say peace and safety, and then comes sudden destruction. That's the sixth seal. So there, that's why Hebrews 13 says to always entertain strangers because you never know if you're entertaining an angel unaware. And then it proceeds to tell you more about what's going on right now about even elders rising up and are watching over you and to hold them in, in, in a certain regard because they watch for your souls. It's right there in Hebrews 13. But how do you tell people that when they're not, not reading the Bible? You know, another thing is 1 Thessalonians 5. It's the same context. But you, brethren, aren't, dis, aren't, aren't ignorant that, that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night because you're already the ones that are... And it tells you that he has leaders over you that are teaching you these things. You guys aren't ignorant. You know that it's the sixth seal. You have the key of David. You're going to be kept from the hour of temptation that's coming upon the whole earth because you hold the key of David. Because you're in the, in the gate rebuking. Don't cast your pearl to swine. The pearl in the gate is your watchman. That's, the, that's what it's talking about. That's what everybody's doing. The pearl in the gate is the name of the disciple of the tribe. It's in Revelation 21. There's a name of each disciple on each gate. And those who prophesy in the name of a disciple, look what it says about that. You know, those who enter into the work of the prophets, that means it's already written. Everything is told to us. We stay there watching what the word of God says, obeying the prophecy. That means that you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you warn other people. The other ones just like it. And love your neighbor as yourself. Tell them what's going on. That's what it means. So who's doing that? Which, which of these guys out there, these, is Adam from Parable of, Parable of the Vineyard doing that? No, he was, but he went to the right. 
Why? Because inside of his heart, he's thinking selfishly. That's what happens to people. He, he stopped listening. Something happened to him inside. Why is guys like Nick Vanderland shoving the calendar down your throat? Why? Because he thinks that that's what it means to be a watchman. That's not what watching is. Watching means that you fulfill the royal law. You don't put stumbling blocks in front of the people. These are the poor and the meek that are going to be saved. Quickly write a check for half. Your stewardship's going to be taken away from you if you don't tell the plain, simple truth. You see, I'm bringing that up again because it's so important that they come to that conclusion and quit being unjust stewards. They need to know that too. And I'm telling you right now, let no man take your crown because it's going to be taken by a lot of people because the 11th hour harvest workers are the ones that are, the last will be first. So that means that the last people that join up and start getting into that watchtower and doing the work are the ones that are chosen. The majority of them, the last will be first. So what's that to me? It's God's will be done. It's written, so shall it be. Even if I don't even make it and you guys do, so be it. That's what God's will is. That's what I'm going to say. That's, the, that's what I will say. What he says unto the porter, he says unto all the servants, watch. So that means you all become watchmen. You've been a, you can go read about the watchman and take on that responsibility yourself. Ask him for the strength and power. Ask him to harden your face against them. Ask him to do that. Ask anything in his will and he will do it. Ask him. Give him, ask him for the strength to do what I do. That's what you need to do. Ask him right now. Get on your knees and ask him to anoint you with the, the Holy Spirit that causes forgiveness. That's what makes you strong. When you forgive, when you truly forgive, there's not one thing that anybody can say that'll stop you. Your, your confidence is in your forgiveness. It is amazing when God does that. My favorite thing he ever did for me, and he made sure it was noticeable. When I repented even from that Christmas tree, he, he gave me John 20, 23, and says, whose sins you remit, they will be remitted, and whose you retain, they will be retained. But the verse before that is, he blew his Holy Spirit onto you. And I, I didn't recognize that until later because he didn't give me the verse before. He only gave me that one. But I wish I read it at the time, but I didn't need to really because I knew, wow, God did this to me because I knew I couldn't forgive people until that moment. When I gave up that tree and put that idolatry in my truck, I took all my movies, all my, my rock and roll CDs, everything that I thought was, all the books that were in this house and whatever, and they went into my truck. I took them to the dump and goodbye, good, good riddance. I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit to get rid of anything that was idolatry. And then he put his spirit of forgiveness on me. And I, there's not, not a chance I could forgive the sins that people did to me, I'll tell you that. When I got chastised, it was by people. They attacked me like nobody's business. And I forgive them all. In fact, I feel sorry for them. So, and from there, that's when I, that's when I went, that, that's when I started exploding with knowledge even more. That's when he spoke to me and said, Mark, everything that I show you, always give me the glory for it. He told me several times after that, that year, I saw so many things happen that year, including, I truly believe that the Messiah came and visited me just before the Revelation 12, one sign in 2017. And he said some weird stuff and I just mentioned it on another video. So that's, you know, it's personal. I know it's hard for people to believe things like that, but I'm telling you, it was amazing. And if you can believe it, it yeah, then good for you because it happened. This guy disappeared right, right before my eyes. So, And he had a sign that said traveling and it fits everything. It fits the whole story because as soon as all that stuff was happening, that's when I, I came to, to repentance to the, all the holy covenants and I started to get to work. You see, because he asked me to be a watchman before that. So it was like 
uh, he was he, he was going to teach me everything. So then I get this visitation, whether it was an angel or it was the Messiah himself. But he had a sign that said traveling. And, and he gives his servants their talents and the things that they're supposed to do. And blessed are the servants that are doing what his Lord has required. Well, how can his servants do the things that re required of them if they weren't given it? Do you understand that? So do you really believe your Bible or not? Because I certainly do. I know exactly what's going on over here with me. Well, I shouldn't say it like that. I know exactly what he's shown me so far, but I know that there's more to come because he gives his servants the meat in due season so that you can give it to the household. That's why I do this. I'm always giving to the household. The household has 21 people in it right now. And others watch these videos later. So how many of them are wolves? I have no idea. I hope none. But I, it's not the way it works, you know? They will spy things out and they will go and they use things and they try to accuse you of this and they do everything to destroy the work because they are the ones going to the pit. They are going to answer for their deeds. They do not understand the scriptures. They once ate your bread with you, but that has to happen. You have to go through the same thing Yeshua did. No servant is above his master. So what he, the whole point in that is, is to let you know what's going to happen to you. There is something that I want you to notice, and I mentioned it the other day, but I want to actually do a, do a whole video on it, but I'm going to give you a prelude to it. When, when, when Yeshua was getting crucified, have a look. Maybe it, it'll prick your heart to even do it yourself, but I'm going to do it, I think. But have a look at... Um, all the accounts in the Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of all the soldiers and what they did. And look at the dynamic and compare it to the 144,000 being called and those who don't make it. So spitting in his face, slapping him in his face, um, putting the crown of thorns on him. That crown of thorns is Ephraim, okay? The helmet is Ephraim. And it was a crown of thorns. The briars and thorns are around the watchmen of Ephraim. It's crazy. When you start connecting dots like this, it's, uh, they parted his garments. Um, they gave him, um, did they give him gall to drink or was it, it was vinegar. Yes, I can't remember. Vinegar and, I got to read it because it's stuff that's in the Psalms and whatever. But it was always this, all these soldiers were the ones that are doing it. So the soldiers represent the army, okay? And so there's the, I just got to look at the, the wording and stuff like that and, and do a, a study on it. I am compelled to, uh, I know there's some meat in there. Another thing that you'll notice, I've never ever really talked about it, but the differences in the gospel, even in, in uh, I have talked about this, but I haven't really done a study I, I sometimes just try to inspire people to look into these things themselves and do some work themselves but look at the difference between the gospels you'll you'll notice like the wine was given to messiah by three different people or four different people and there's four different reactions and there's four different type types of wine look at the way messiah acts when he's being accused by Pilate, look at his reactions, look at the difference between the Olivet discourses because he actually repeats himself three times and in John, it's all about the adulterous woman. That's when the event takes place there. So you do a comparison to that, there's a massive meat in that stuff. So it's the differences in the Gospels that are actually the meat, you know, and that's the way it is. It's, it's the other day we discovered, right? Those of you who watched it, and I talked about it in this video, which should have really brought it home even more because I just recognized that even live right in front of you, that we just discovered the other day that Amos chapter 5, those last couple verses, is what, what Stephen was quoting in Acts 7, uh, specifically verse 43, and he changes the word from Damascus to Babylon. And that to me is like one of the most amazing things. And um, because beyond Damascus is Babylon in the sense of the future. And so what Stephen was doing, because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, 
He was prophesying to us for us to even notice that. And we just noticed it as a group of people just the other day together. Just because I saw it, it means we all saw it. So, and that's the meet and do season right there, you guys. That's the meet and do season. He gives you those things. We know 100% that Mystery Babylon is the United States of America because of things like that. You know? And it's just, and now, we, and then, and then again, he's showing me this morning, the Holy Spirit's put me into Acts 15 to see something different in there. Again, it's quoting Amos, but chapter nine this time, putting connection to what we learned last week or a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was, and he's bringing us back to Amos again. See how that's how it works all the time. That's the way it works. I've been living my life like that for eight years like that, just living by the spirit. Wherever he leads me, I go. And I'm all through the word of God all the time. And that's why I see all these amazing, amazing, amazing things. And, uh, you know, I'm laughing because go look at my first videos, how, what a fumble I was back then. Like, but I was still living the same faith back then. And look at where it led me now. You see, the same way I'm living right now is the same way I was living whatever, four or five years ago, not knowing how to even reach out to the people and I, but I already knew what God had told me, shown me. I knew a ton of stuff back then, but I only had an opportunity for 15 minutes of video and all the things that I knew back then were not, I didn't want to be presumptuous, so I couldn't say too much yet. So I just started rebuking about Christmas and stuff like that a lot. But look at how I fumble over everything. And I mean, it's just ridiculous, the change and how much I know now compared to the beginning. I knew it back then, but I didn't, wasn't confident enough in knowledge to be able to utter the anything out of my mouth because I wasn't, uh, I knew there was things I didn't know. Okay. So I wasn't allowed to say things until the time came. So I've been always walking in that path and that's why we're at the place we're at right now. And, and it shows you, I was, I can't remember who it was. I think it was, it doesn't matter. Like I, I said, I think I said it even to a couple people, if you watch the progression and you, you missed a bunch because I did a lot on, well, you could go to Instagram. Instagram, a lot of those videos are still there. It's uh, like one man, underscore in between each word. It's all spelled out. So like, underscore one, underscore man. And you can look at those videos. Just watch the progression over time. You know, you'll watch that progression if you just skip over like 10 or 20 videos and then go to the next one. And then if you, and then just watch five minutes of it, you're going to see this progression of when I didn't, I knew stuff, but I was learning as I was going because the Holy Spirit's always been giving us meat and due season over here for your guys' sake. You know, he, <coughs> what he, he's always been like this. When things arise and start happening, like, like say bad things, like people are behaving, he shows me it's written right there that they're going to do it. So he, he, so events would take place like, okay, the prophecy about Judah hating the Northern kingdom of Israel. So he really showed me way back a few years ago um, how important it is to rebuke this in Judah. So I started doing that. Uh, one time he spoke to me and says, rebuke women. He even gave me a bit of trouble. He, Why are you not rebuking my daughters? And so I did. <laughs> they don't listen. Most of them don't listen, but neither do men. You know, men won't listen because they don't think that a man in my, that I was appointed to do this should be an authority over them. The women don't listen because they're so used to being in the American system, which really is the Western culture who has allowed women to rule over them. They, they they have that Jezebel spirit in them. The Ahabs have the Ahab spirit in them. You know, it's the same thing. And they're not going to, a lot of people, most people, the vast majority of people are not going to, are not going to let go of that. You know, they're not, they're not going to submit. But, but the remnant will, okay? So it, it's just amazing to me. I'm just proclaiming the progression, the meet and do season comes to his servants. So if you want to see if I'm a liar or not, that's my point. Go watch it. You know, I don't, I don't premeditate my, my, uh, anything I say. I don't say a single thing with notes. I don't sit there and, you know, think about it. No, I'm inspired. I show you what the word of God says and I just spit it on the mic and you're not going to see contradictions. That's the crazy part. I have not had, I have not been 
uh, approached once about contradictions. I've been approached about people who don't understand what I'm saying, but not there's no there's no contradictions. You can't you're not going to catch me in a lie. What you will catch me in is saying the wrong scripture sometimes, and I apologize for that. And you know your brain is full. You know you fumble over your words a little bit. You know you meant to say something else, and you and it happens to a lot of different people. You know that's why some people they're good. They're able to vet. Uh, uh, edit their videos, but I don't know how to do that because I'm a dummy, okay? But I just go off of what the Holy Spirit shows me and well, I confuse some some uh, scriptures once in a while. I apologize for that. But maybe, you know, you know, it, it shows me also that people aren't listening because the odd time someone does catch me and I'm like, yep, yep, yep. I meant to say Mark 9, not Matthew 9 or something like that, right? Or, you know, you, it, same thing happens when you send out a tweet and your thumb's too big and you hit chapter 29 and you meant to hit 19, you know, like it's things like that. And then, the, but the wicked people are like, like there is no such thing. And then, and, 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 you know, like they, they, um, they, they can't think that there's possibly a, you know, a, a autocorrect error or something like that, you know? So anyways, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting world we live in. And, uh, and, uh, and make sure you don't cast stumbling blocks in front of other people because it makes it so much harder to bring them to, to the Messiah, to the truth, you know, to wait, to wait for what God's plan is. When's he going to restore his kingdom? In his time. So we're over here in captivity and we have to wait until things are sanctified to do certain things. So he made it very, very simple for us to come to repentance in order to receive the Holy Spirit, right? Remember Cornelius, as soon as he turned to follow God, the Holy Spirit came to him. And then, then he got baptized after that, which means he was baptized into the Ten Commandments, the, the Holy Covenant of Promise, the refreshing of the covenant, you know? But his heart already, God saw his heart was right to start obeying. And that's why he entered in by doing that. Was he perfect at that point or anything like that? No, no, he entered in. That's what now God's spirit, pardon me, helps him. As long as you remain in him, he will remain in you. That's amazing to me. As long as you keep confessing your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know, Paul had that thorn in his side all the time. Until the end, he finally finished the race. And that thorn was in his side. Why? To keep him humble. Because otherwise, he would have got puffed up. So, and that was, God permitted it to happen to him, to have that thorn, so that he would, he was safe from, from, from uh, becoming prideful, you know? It's, it's, um, it's God's grace. My grace is sufficient enough. When the time comes, he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You get it? I'm telling you that for your own encouragement. You know, to I'm not telling you to be sloppy, but I'm telling you to have that conviction on your heart. Don't sit there and beat yourself up in the head and say, I'm never going to be able to accomplish this. You need to understand that God said certain things that he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness through his son. He will sup with you. He... The patience of Yeshua, this is what it's talking about. But if, you're, if your heart isn't right, it's never going to happen. Your heart has to be right. So that's what's going on. You got to accept the conviction on your heart, and that's your faith. If you, can, if you can accept the conviction, you're being faithful, accepting the conviction, and then you start to learn what he wants of you. That's what he's looking for. That's his, that's his babies. That's his boys and girls. And it don't matter if you're 100 years old or if you're 10. So you just keep walking. Keep walking. Walk that walk. Run the race. You remember he said that the tree doesn't bear fruit, doesn't bear fruit, doesn't bear fruit. Then he even dungs it a little bit. That would be a chastisement. And then it starts to bear the fruit. You know? Or fertilizing it, right? Like who gives it a little extra. And if it still doesn't bear fruit, then it gets hewn down and thrown in the fire. So the, the, the dry tree, and he tells you in the last days, if they do this when the tree is green, what are they going to do when the tree is dry? Right? So 
that means they're not they're disobedient to the to the covenant of Israel. That's what it means. They don't they don't have even leaves. It's a dry tree. No leaves. The leaves is the Ten Commandments, the the obedience to the to the to the covenants. But what's the fruit? The fruits of the spirit, the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God produces the things it says it will produce. So you're gonna know what loving that's the royal law. Ultimately, it's the royal law, and you'll understand prophecy. You will heal the people's blind eyes, their deaf ears, and you'll get them to walk because they were Daddy. they were lame and couldn't Come walk. On. You want to go? Yeah. You don't even have socks on. You didn't even brush your hair, and I told you to. Don't tell me to come. No, Gracie. Okay, I got to go, guys. Talk to you later. I don't know if this is going to end, though. See, it's stuck. I can, my phone is broken. I'm going to have to just shut my phone off, and it'll probably lose. Um, well, I guess I can uh, share it. I can share it on Twitter. I'm Well, I'm still here. Okay, I, I can't even shut this thing off. So if I, if I shut my phone off, it'll probably just lose. This whole thing will be lost. So whatever. It doesn't much matter. You guys heard the message anyway. Hopefully you put it, to, put it to practice. It's pretty neat, the things that you can compare from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When you do that, that's what it's called, reading scripture line upon line here a little there, a little precept upon precept. That's how you get the knowledge of God. And that's how you know you're walking in the truth. It's amazing. That's your confidence right there. That's the joy of the Lord. So have a good day.